You are about to listen to a conversation that I had with Mark Hoplamazian, the president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels Corporation, which has almost 200,000 employees around the world. My conversation with Mark is actually one of the favorite conversations that I had from the over 100 CEOs that I interviewed for my book, Leading with Vulnerability. Again, these conversations are unscripted, they're candid. CEOs like Mark had no idea what I was going to ask them, which made it all that much more fun. So the insights are real, they are authentic, and uh, they're extremely, extremely valuable and I think practical. So if you wanna hear more from CEOs just like Mark, and if you want to get access to the book, you can go to leadwithvulnerability.com to grab a copy for yourself. You can also join the community where we're gonna be releasing the full episodes, the archives of all of these interviews that I've done. Head over to greatleadership.substack.com. Again, that's greatleadership.substack.com. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Mark Hoplamazian, the president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels Corporation. All right, um, so very first question for you then is, uh, when you hear the phrase, vulnerable leader, what comes to mind for you? What does that make you think of? Uh, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind uh, when I hear a vulnerable leader uh, is someone who's open and sharing um, <clears throat> and plain in terms of how they talk about themselves, plain spoken about how they talk about themselves. So that, uh, that authenticity piece, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. Definitely authentic and and um, there's a there's a, a bit of a what you see is what you get kind of uh, uh, element to it like you know not, not not really trying to be the personification of a role but rather be a real human being first and foremost and and demonstrating what that means in for that person. Okay, uh, and why do you think that's so important? Because we all know leaders who don't have those qualities and and don't act that way. But for you, why is vulnerability so important? Well, vulnerability, I think, is is one piece of the puzzle. It's not the it's not the only attribute that's important. But I think um, for me, uh, I guess early in my career, I uh, learned that my title is the booby prize. Um, you end up with the ability to get compliance, but that's very different than connecting with people. Oh, okay. And I never uh, wanted to have people motivated by uh, executing orders that they, <laughs> they might take from me, but rather, um, you know, helping to discover what direction we should take and, and helping them along that path. And, um, and I think that the only way that that works is that people don't see you as your title. They don't see yeah. you as the author authority figure, but rather uh, a real person who has a certain job to do, but is really someone who they can relate to and someone who they can understand in human terms, not just in hierarchical terms. So you so, said early on in your career, was there a time when uh, you were more of that command and control and people just saw the title and they just did what you told them to do and you, you kind of had a realization or were you always this kind of a, a leader who practice empathy and vulnerability? Yeah, no, actually there are, t there are just a couple of things that I would mention. The first is when I first showed up, um, I knew, I knew little about the actual operating business itself. I knew a lot about the financial structure and the legal structure. I didn't know much about the operating business. And in one of the first meetings I had with our head of sales and marketing, I asked some questions um, that I was curious about <clears throat> uh, relating to, who our biggest customers were and how their revenue with us broke down and so forth and so on. And two and a half weeks later, I got a, a massive report back and I, di I didn't actually intend for them to go and do all that work that I was just trying to get his, you know, glean something from him. And that it hit me that, you know, when you have my title and you ask a question like that, uh, some people see that as a mandate to go and do something. And so I, it took me a long time to appreciate what the shadow of, lead, of the leader was and how to manage that. So you didn't uh, put people through paces that you didn't intend. Yeah. Um, 
And then I had a, 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 a very interesting experience. One of the first conferences that I was a part of, it was an owner a conference of hotel owners. Our, our guest speaker was Tom Ridge, who was um, formerly the governor of Pennsylvania and the first secretary of Homeland Security. And it had a long military background. And he said to me, he met with me for about 15 minutes before he came on stage and said, hey, I've been doing some research on you. I see that you're relatively new in your job. You're less than a year into it. What have you learned? What, what's the most important thing you've learned so far? And I actually, my response to him was the words I used a minute ago with you, which was, I think I've learned that my title is the booby prize. And he said, he, he ripped him out and said, well, you've learned one of the most valuable leadership lessons. And I said, I'm really shocked to hear you say that because I, seeing your background in the military, I thought, you know, autocracy and authoritarianism was uh, what, you know, <laughs> how, how people in the military actually would lead. And he said, on the contrary, the best leaders, the ones who rise to the very top, joint chiefs and otherwise, are fantastic people leaders first and foremost. They don't rely on their rank to get stuff done. They, they are, you know, you can get people to comply, but if you want their hearts and minds uh, and souls, then you've got to really lead through human lens. And I, yeah. it really landed with me. Mm -hmm. It really landed with me. Yeah, I like your point about, so there's a difference between people doing things because you're telling them to do it because of your title. Yeah versus getting people to really buy in and, and want to do it because they're following a vision and they're following you as a person, not as a job title. Um, right. And, and ac actually, I forgot to ask, how many employees do you guys have now? About 165,000. Wow, 165,000. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay, 165,000 employees, a massive global organization. And so I, I know that putting people first and vulnerabilities is, is an important aspect for you. Um, but if you were to imagine vulnerability kind of like on a scale, where let's say one to five and on the five is something that makes you feel very vulnerable, very uncomfortable, very emotionally exposed. What would be a five for you on that vulnerability scale for you personally? Well, I think, um, I think the things that are at that end of the scale, uh, relate to things that are deeply emotionally felt. So talking about my family, hmm. experiences I've had with my family, talking about um, delicate or sensitive topics like mental health or including my own mental health, um, those are sensitive topics. Yeah. And they, there's a tremendous level of sort of trust that you put into others when you go into topics like that. Um, and so I would say that those are probably at that end of the spectrum. Okay. Um, so, and, and why, so what is it about those subjects, whether you're talking about your own mental health or your family or a sensitive subject, why does that make you feel the most vulnerable? Like what's the underlying thing behind it? Well, I think that, I think the reason I, I one feels, I feel vulnerable is that it, there's so much emotion coursing. Uh, through me when those topics come up or when I talk talk about them that um, you know it's a, you feel exposed um, in, in a way that uh, is atypical in a business context sometimes yeah. um, not you know you wouldn't necessarily see uh, people sharing things uh, of a very personal nature at scale yeah. <laughs> in normal life so um, but it is something that I have found to be really important during the pandemic. So many people were going through so many challenges with respect to how they were managing their lives that um, what I realized is talking about my own challenges helped to provide context for them and maybe even allow people not to feel alone in that journey. Yeah. Mm. Um, so even if we went one level deeper, so emotionally exposed, is it because it makes you kind of question yourself and question who you are as a leader? Is that kind of like the even one layer deeper behind the emotion? Is it because it makes you ask these tough questions about yourself and who you are? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, I mean, you know, we have focused on empathy as a, as a critical capability for a long time. And I thought I was a very empathetic person. Um, I did some assessments, um, psych psychographic mm -hmm. assessments. And, um, it turns out that, you know, my, my, uh, my in 
in inherent uh, uh, inclination or or practice of empathy was at a relatively low level, lower level, interesting, below fifty in the scale. And I was shocked, so I, I pretty much rejected the the result. <laughs> but I decided to go home and and talk to my kids about it, and I realized after talking to them that it was true, uh, because they gave me some very plain feedback. It wasn't mean spirited and it wasn't uh, hyperbolic. It was like, yeah, I mean, I know you think you're present when you drive us to school, but you're on your phone half the time. And uh, sometimes at red lights, you're checking your emails and we have to tell you that the light turned green. And then I started thinking, wow, that's absolutely correct. And yeah. that's not that's not a practice of empathy. That's a practice of distraction. So it's hard. I, um, I'm very much guilty of that sometimes. And I have to remember, like even I have a two year old and a six year old. Uh, and I have to remember very consciously, like if I'm with them or dinner time, I try not to even keep my phone near me because you just, you, you, yeah. just, you have so many apps and like buttons and things on there that it's people are not comfortable being bored anymore. We always have to busy ourselves. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And it does, it does require, I think you have to be deliberate about it. Yeah. So I think that, that's an example of how I don't, you know, when you start getting into those kinds of topics, you start to question your own efficacy in being empathetic at work, yeah. which I think is the practice of empathy is critical in our business and, and in particular at Hyatt. So I would say, sure, it's a, it's a constant reminder and something that is, um, you know, anxiety inducing from time to time. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, can you share a time and, and one of the reasons that I'm going to ask this is because a lot of people like stories and examples and situations from leaders' lives and, and you know, their things that they've done. Um, so can you think of a time when you had to be vulnerable at work with your team and can you share the story or the context around it and what the impact behind it was? Yeah, I mean, um, we were doing uh, empathy training uh, back in 2012 and I um, one of the things that um, we were doing is in pairs, there were, there were a group of us, um, and I was going through it like anybody else would. Um, so I, I, I joined up with a GM that was in that same training. And one of the topics that we were supposed to go and talk to the team at the hotel, this was in Mexico city. Um, we were supposed to go talk to team members about recognition mm -hmm. and how they were recognized at work and what we could do better or different to elevate our recognition of their work. So I sat with the assistant front office manager and, um, you know, what, again, back to the booby prize of my title, the conversation at the inception of that was a lot of, um, everything's great. Like it's all great. Um, and I was trying to understand like how she came into the Hyatt family cause we had bought the hotel, uh, two years prior. And I wanted to know about like the, her beginnings at Hyatt and how that first day was, or actually it was one year, one year prior. And it was great. Everything was great because I'm the CEO and she's terrified and, um, and it makes you feel horrible. Like it's the, it's the worst feeling uh, for me. So I, I actually started off um, asking her some more basic questions about what that morning was like. Was it sunny? How long did it take you to get to work? Just to put her in the moment and then talked about my first days at work and how anxious I was and how scared I was. Because I, I was taking on an organization much bigger than anything I'd ever run before. And I, I just shared that with her. And, um, you know, within a couple of minutes, uh, we were both in tears because she was, she was relating to me how our onboarding process at that time was all about the various ways in which you could get fired. Uh, wow. From that. That, was the, that, that was the onboarding process. And I was mortified. Um, and she said, I heard all these great things about the Hyde family, but then I had form after form after form I had to fill out and sign. And, and I had, you know, people telling me that there were consequences for doing this thing wrong or that thing badly or whatever. And we came out of that and I thought, okay, well, that's a fail. We've got, we've got to go back to the drawing board and redo our <laughs> onboarding process and, and really make it a welcoming event and a celebration. And by the way, we'll get to the legal documents that you need to fill out some later date. So I think, you know, she was terrified to be talking to me at the inception, but I think that by opening up and just saying, look, when I started, 
I really felt uncomfortable and I was really scared, um, allowed her to sort of say, well, I guess if he's prepared to admit that, then I might as well share what my actual experience was like. And I think that was a big unlock. Um, That's a good story. The, when was this? Was this a while ago? It's a while, it was a while ago. So that really cemented in my mind the importance of this. This is back in 2012. Wow. Um, uh, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And uh, it's anytime that you have that sort of powerful connection and um, and someone relates something that was hard for them, but also really real about their lives, you have to, it, it, it's sort of like it commands your respect um, yeah. as a human being. And I'm assuming you guys ended up making changes internally, but oh, yeah. fundamentally, yeah. But it's one of those things where had you not been vulnerable and had she not shared with you, things probably who knows if they would have ever changed. Yeah, I think that's right. And you know, I think that it also goes to um, you know being thoughtful about how you design things because uh, so you know, not surprisingly, that that process that was in place was designed by our legal department and our HR department, yeah. not through the lens of a new colleague coming into the Hyatt family, but through the lens of what their requirements were. And it was a huge stark reminder that if you want to design something great, design it through the lens of the person who's going to be the user. Yeah. And in this case, that was a fail. So mm -hmm. that was many lessons came out of that many lessons. You mentioned uh, that one of the things that makes you most vulnerable is talking about mental health or sensitive issues and topics. Um, do you have any stories or situations you can share about something that made you feel very, very vulnerable and uncomfortable, like one of those um, types of things that you mentioned? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think in the in the pandemic, early in the pandemic, we realized that business was um, going to be gone for a long a while. A yeah. long time and that we would need to make layoffs and um i think that uh i felt vulnerable for many reasons we our purpose as a company is to care for people so they can be their best and the and the sense of care um and and really um engaging at a human level is really the center point um it's the it's the it's the key thing in our culture and in how we actually interact with one another so how do you reconcile being a caring organization and caring for people so they can be their best and yet at the same time have to effectuate a massive reduction in force um and so you feel vulnerable for many reasons fundamental reasons like how can this be right yeah how do i reconcile these things am i actually is this a dereliction of my responsibility to fulfilling our purpose? Um, how do you reconcile those things? And, and you feel very out of sorts. Ironically, I also had, you know, a lot on my mind with respect to financial viability and uh, total liquidity and financial capacity to endure a lot of losses. And yet that's actually, I, I just had inherent confidence and I have a lot of background in that area. So I felt like I could figure that out. Mm -hmm. It was the people aspects of managing through the pandemic that caused tremendous vulnerability and tremendous anxiety. Did, did um, you ever think that your business might not survive? Yeah, there were definitely at the very beginning, I thought um, if it depends on how long this actually, how, how severe it gets and how long it takes to recover because the, the lockdown in, in, you know, that began on March 12th and 13th across the country was really shocking. Um, nobody had ever experienced anything like it. I mean, it was, yeah. you know, and, and our, our revenue base was off 95% in the next month. And, you know, that wow, catches 95%. your 95%. Yeah. So we were, yeah, we were sort of sitting around thinking, okay, well, you know, how many months of liquidity do we have? Um, where are we going to get capital? Um, who, who could be potential buyers of assets that we've got? I mean, you go through a lot of contingency planning because you have no idea. There's no visibility whatsoever. Yeah. Everything was opaque. People didn't understand the virus. Let's not forget, like the very first thing that people did was ran out and got wipes uh, until yeah. people months and months later, even a year later, only then realized it wasn't, it wasn't communicated through a surface contact. It was aerosolized. So we, the level of ignorance was so high um, and that's, that creates tremendous uncertainties. 
So you sort of have to just, you know, kind of um, believe that there that science will catch up with it. Some of the early prognostications from some of the major consulting firms was that we would be three years before we had vaccines. Wow. Um, you know, at that at that point, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it wasn't it wasn't the financial part that really um, that really affected me. It was all it was all people issues, and um, so yeah, I, I would say that that was sort of a severe example of how. Um, uh, you know the current commercial realities definitely resulted in a lot of anxiety and a lot of a lot of vulnerability. How many people did you guys have to lay off? We ended up laying off about um, thirty five percent of our corporate staff and a higher number of our field staff, so yeah. tens of thousands of people. I remember seeing the video from Arnie Sorensen um, before he passed away. I don't, did you ever see that video that he did? Uh, I've seen, I saw one video he posted during the pandemic, but, uh, if that's the one you're talking about. Yeah. Where he was like, um, you know, he got very emotional. You could see tears in his eyes where he was talking about the impact it was going to have to the business. And at that point he was going through chemo. So he already lost all of his hair and it was just, you know, it was one of those like viral videos that a lot of people shared because they were very touched how this leader who's going through his own times, you know, and, and of course he passed away a few months later. Um, but was still trying to take care of his people and felt so, you, you could tell that he was like very upset and just crushed by what was happening. And it was, it's probably the same video that you saw. Yep, it is. Yeah. yeah, it was a very hard thing for a lot of, a lot of people to see. And um, yeah, I think a lot of people respected and admired him for it uh, before he passed away. But it's, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the vulnerability piece is, very, very challenging for a lot of leaders. Um, you mentioned also mental health and family. So is, this is something that you're comfortable talking with uh, in front of your team or just like a select group of people at the company? I have, I have uh, been talking about the importance of mental health now for um, a long time. I would say um, a year and a half at least. Okay. Maybe, maybe not more than that. Um, and the reason I started talking about it so much was because of, of the level of stress that I was under. And I started to recognize the impact that it was having on me. Um, I saw it in my children. Um, and, uh, and so I, was, I became increasingly concerned uh, about managing through that and about helping my kids get through it. But what impact um, was it having? Like, what did you start to notice about yourself or feel? Oh, uh, you know, just, uh, I would say, uh, tremendous sleep, <laughs> sleep related problems to, to start with, but also just, you know, feelings of, uh, of, um, inadequacy and inability to sort of, um, uh, render, uh, disparate facts into something I could feel confidence in, um, and, by the way, meanwhile, I'm leaving the company, so I am, I am keeping a positive attitude on really on behalf of the, my colleagues, but personally going through a lot of questions, internal questions about my capacity and my um, and my own ability to sort of manage through. Yeah. So I was feeling I was feeling those the, the, that pretty acutely, and I thought, well, geez, if I, I'm a pretty strong person. I'm, you know, inherently a glass half full, very future focused person. If I'm if I'm experiencing this and I've got family members who are going through this too, and we've got a strong family, I can't imagine if you had other challenges in your life or you had a less coher co cohesive family, how are other people managing through this? Yeah. So I started talking about it extensively because I thought I don't I want to try to be an example of how you can talk about these things and try to remove some of the stigma associated with it and started started to actually talk about what we were going to do. We, we created resources um, to make sure that we were identifying where people were stressing out and, and experiencing ex extreme anxiety or maybe depression. Um, and we enlisted help from some medical institutions, including Cornell, to help us develop a tracker and resources, yeah. identifying resources that people could 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 access, um, and then you know I 
and then more personally on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I talked to my team members um, about how their families were doing. And I ended up, at the end of that year, I wrote a letter to every spouse of every one of my direct reports about um, what I had experienced with their spouse, uh, my direct report over the past year as a thank you letter to the family. Because I said, you know, this is really important for them to understand just how remarkable they their spouses have been in helping tens of thousands of people get through a really challenging year and and acknowledging that I'm sure that their families likewise had experienced some really serious issues along the way, but um, I felt it was really important for, for them to know just how much of an impact that their loved one had in the high family. And I had family members, I had, sorry, direct reports who lost family members over the course of the year. So it was uh -huh. particularly, it was particularly um, challenging. So I would say um, it, it's all of those things um, together, but, you know, uh, and I ended up in conversations with individuals about how they were doing, about how their kids were doing. Um, you know, we all had um, teenagers. Uh, most of us had teenagers uh, living at home, so they were going through their own stresses and strains. And um, we became like a support group. It wasn't like a, a collective support group. It was more like, you know, sharing individual um, experiences and seeking out sort of perspective and advice and and ideas and just support. So that's what it, really what it turned into. But um, I, so I would say it's both. It was both at a at a broad level talking about mental health as a construct and what we were doing to help people in the company, but also one on one to really try to be more. Um, uh, plugged into and in tune with what was going on with my own direct reports. And that was a very vulnerable thing, talking about that mental health aspect for you? Yeah, I mean, it, I, by the way, I, I recognize that it's uh, it's a sensitive topic for others. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's not something that even as, you know, you go towards a period of time when a lot more people are talking much more openly about it, there's still stigma associated with it. It's um, It's not it's not the easiest thing to talk about because it, you know, goes into, uh, it goes into maybe, uh, your own sense of, uh, vulnerability or, or, um, you know, uh, being, being at risk in some way, shape or form. And it's a weird thing. Like I'm there, I'm their boss. And, and so do you want to really admit that you're having a tough time to your boss instead of, Hey, no, I got this. I'm going to be great and blah, blah, blah. So uh, there's, there are many different cross currents that you need no. to recognize are, are true. If you want to get access to the second part of this conversation, remember to head over to greatleadership.substack.com. We're putting the first half of these conversations on all these different platforms like YouTube, Apple, Spotify, etc. But to get access to the second part of these conversations, you need to go to greatleadership.substack.com. Enter your email over there and we're going to be releasing a lot of these really amazing and candid discussions over the coming weeks and months as we head over to the book launch, which is October 3rd. And remember, you can also pre-order a copy, which I hope you do, at leadwithvulnerability.com. Again, I interviewed 100 CEOs, surveyed 14,000 employees, and the whole premise of the book is looking at how leaders can approach vulnerability in the right way. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion. I'll see you next time.